My name is John Hall. I'm with Blues Creek Guitars. I've been a member of Asia for, I don't know, 15, 16 years. I've been a member for a while. Okay, how many here have done a 45 or a 42 Pro Bind? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, you don't count. You're going to go down with it. 42. 42, okay. We're going to do basically a 40, a 40 style binding. Uh, I've already prepped this in advance, and I have one here that I've already routed. Now, I do use my binding machine that you're probably familiar with on uh, eBay and my kit guitar forum and YouTube. So, because of the tool issue, we aren't going to run that tool, but you're welcome to stop by my table and I can explain how the routing process works. I do use a binding machine. The binding machine will hold my router perpendicular to the table. This little contraption here allows me to adjust my table so that I am always perpendicular and have my top parallel to the table, even when I do the back. Because the back has a radius and it's also set at a taper. Now, well, everybody is here. How many are staying in Hemlock in the door? Okay, we need to ask your cooperation in that it is an alcohol-free dorm. And if you want to drink, you're welcome to do so. Do it down at the pavilion or underneath the cafeteria. Your card will allow you in, I think they call it Danbury Hall. And please uh, take the alcohol to your car and get it out of your dorm rooms, please. Uh, I'm just asking you, the reason is there's high school students in the dorm and they just don't want us to have our adult water in our room. So, Can we French polish in the dorm? What's that? Can we French polish in the dorm? That uses alcohol. That is uh, paint salt. Go ahead. As long as it's not humanly, what are you using? Pure grain grapes, pure grain alcohol. It's legal in the state where I come from. Well, this is since it's alcohol free, you can French polish down in Dan Berry Hall. <laughs> One of the most fun jobs is removing tape. I use a very specific tape for this. It used to be 3M uh, 233 number tape, it is now 401. Uh, I also have. We have this, we have Pearl on a YouTube video, don't we? Yeah, there's a couple. You have a Style 42 DVD. Hello, Mr. Ford. It is a pleasure to see you. Likewise. Yeah. And I saw Mr. Earlywine is in here somewhere. Uh, he sneaked out, I think. Uh, he saw I was here. Okay, if you notice some of the, the, the rain is coming up. Oh, wonderful. Okay, that is what you want to try to do to avoid that is pull your tape across the grain like that, and that will help you eliminate that problem. Oh, we also have a distinguished yeah. Yeah. Pat DeBurrow here. Why, why did you switch tape, John? Uh, I switched it only because they, they switched it. They went from the 401, uh, 233 to 401. It's the same tape. Yeah, they just pushed it back on. John, is the 233 now called 401? Correct. So you can't get 233 anymore. Well, the, the 401 is a 233. It's the same tape. Okay. I don't know why they changed the number. I guess they thought 401 sounded better. Than is that, does it have a bit of a stretch to it? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, when I go to bind this, you'll be able to come up. I'll even let some of you people get their fingers off short Why did you quit using the brown binding tape? I never, I never used it. I always used this. I mean, whatever tape you want to use, you can actually ask it. The thing that you want to remember is that when you're putting the tape on, you're always trying to think down and in. And I would also like to wood guide. How many guys use wood binding? Okay. If you use wood binding, oh, we got trouble. Okay. If you use wood binding, uh, as a machinist, I can tell you, you never get a good inside corner. No matter how fresh your bit is. There's always going to be a little bit of a thing there. So you take your wood binding, and on the inside, you want to break that corner. 
That way you are going to maintain your contact to these two points, those two points. Huh? Now, it's not uncommon for you wood binding guys to have some gapping. Uh, I do all of my wood binding when I do use it. I generally do my wood binding at 65 thousandths. And I set my route cup so that I'm about 70 thousandths. I want my route cut so when I put my binding into the route cut, It'll break. I actually want to leave a little step here, and I want to sand my side down to the binding rather than scraping the binding to the side. Um, Why is that? Well, one reason for that is when you're trying to scrape the binding and you're trying to bring your binding flush, okay, that's your body. And let's say you put your binding, it's okay to be a little proud here. But if you bring it down like this and you start scraping it, next thing you know, you have that. Yep, yep. And when you look at your guitar, you're going to see the binding pinch, especially on the back up here. And the reason is when you look at a guitar body, you can see there's about a 9 16th difference from here to here. You're talking about approximately a 15 foot radius, and you have an angle approximately five degrees here and almost square here. So this angle that goes around the body is a dynamic angle. It's constantly changing. So you want to be aware of that. When you set up the, the router, do you set it up square to the sides in that case, or do you set the... Okay, if I'm doing the... Let, let's say I'm going to route the back. Yeah, just the okay. I take my little thing, I set everything down. All of these come down. <coughs> And that way, all of these are in the same plane. So when I put this in here, everything is located off of the top, which is most square to your sides. That creates the sides to be square, and your router is going to be held perpendicular. So when you're doing your, your routing, whether you're using a tower jig, I love the arm jig, because that gives me that third variable in my hand. I can feel what's going on. We've all routed wood where you're getting somewhere, and I call it the flat. You can hear the sound getting a little slappy. You can take off of there and you can back feed. Because nothing's more frustrating than blowing out the big chip out. So in order to route, I will do a series of climb cuts and route cuts. Is there anybody that doesn't know what a climb cut is or a route cut? OK. Here's your body. Perfect scale. All right. The weak zones are right here, okay, because your green is running that way. Your cutter bit is going to be turning clockwise, right? A route cut is going to be going like that. And your angle of attack is coming out of your work. So as you're coming up into this, this weak zone, you have an opportunity to split that out. And when that happens, you have a design enhancement opportunity. That means you can put two in wide binding. So what I will do is I will climb cut this little zone. So now my angle of attack is coming in. Now you'd say, well, why don't you climb cut everything? No matter what you do, you have a mechanical advantage and a disadvantage. Here, you can have a problem of compression. So if you're moving too fast, we've all had a chisel and you dig in and it crushes the wood. So you've got to be careful. And my best advice is learn to read your chip, okay? You're going to do three things when you cut. You're going to either put heat into your work, heat into your tool, or heat into your chip. You want to put the heat in your chip. So if you have dust coming out, you're probably going too, too slow. If you smell smoke, definitely too slow. You want to see little flags coming out. So I'm going to route, climb cut, about an inch in. So basically, there to there and to there to there. That way I have grain support when I come across. Right here, is, that's just your critical point. Then once I clear that out, I kind of come in here and I nibble into the waist. Once I know I'm at the waist, then I can climb cut back this way, okay? And I can route cut this way. I can route cut all the way over to here. Then I'm going to do a little bit of climb cutting in here. And then I can route across. Okay, does that, everybody understand that? Some people call that down milling. Well, 
I'm a machinist. I'm used to route. That's who's usually called it. Yeah. That. <laughs> well, we all do different things. We have terminology in every shop. So down milling, up milling, but another thing. I don't. I'm not a down cut guy. I just like to use a good sharp bit. You can use a down cut here because the chip is being cleared. If you aren't clearing a chip, I, I, you're probably better off using an up cut to get the heat out. But again, it's, if it works for you, then disregard whatever I tell you. So, that is going to be the cutting direction, and does everybody hook up on that? All right? Now, how do you cut it? Uh, I do a couple of things. The more setups you have to make, the more opportunities for screwing up. So generally, I like to start with the top. That's my widest cut. Now, depending upon your bearing cut supplier or whatever you're using, if you're going to start with a wider cut, here's your guitar side. Let's say we're going to do a 45. So that's approximately a quarter of an inch. All right? But you've cut the 60,000 screw down for your pearl, your purfling, and then you're going to cut your binding cut. You have to be aware will your bearing have a tracking surface? I have, I have an old set of binding cutters that have a very thin bearing. So I have to cut from the top down. My newer sets are nice and wide. It doesn't really matter. But if you screw up and you've got to go down pretty far, it is something that you need to be aware of, that you kind of want to do this little thin cut and then do the binding cut. So what I will do is I'll do that, then I'll do this, then I flip it to the back. What about the bearing surface on the bottom of your router? Well, good point. Okay, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, okay. so then I'll, I have done the top, wide cut, and the binding. Now on the back, especially if you're doing a 45 style, the pearl is usually a 50 thousandths wide strip, not the full 16. So you won't have as wide of a cut. So then on the back, I generally cut the binding because I have the binding set already. I only have three setups. I don't have four. But again, you're welcome to do it any way that you find fit. Now, uh, anybody here doing it freehand? Okay, and you're probably having issues. Okay, if you're going to do it freehand, the, the best way that I found when I did freehand is I actually put my router into a workmate and then I could scoop my body around, much like they do at the market factory. Yeah. Because holding the router level all the way around you know, can be tricky. Most binding machines, I have one, and it, I call it a donut. If this is your router base, all right, and this is your cutter, and here's your bearing, and there's your bearing, the donut is at an angle. It comes in here and I have this little shelf here. On the top, you can almost do that flat with the router because the top is reasonably square all the way around. Okay? On the back, you got the rock. So, to compensate this curve on the back, that donut will only contact a limited amount of points on the back so that you take as much of the curve and the taper out of the back as possible, because you want to try to keep your route as square and parallel to the side as possible. If you get that thing caught and twisted, if you're working with like a 45, you got black, white, black, Teflon, black, white, black, then you have the side binding, then you have the bottom side binding with the black, white, black, another piece of poly for pearl and a black, white. So you have all of this that you're fighting. So if nothing is squared up, it's not going to sit properly. So when you do your setups, keep all of that in mind. And again, you want to be just, if you can click your fingernail, that you're, you hear me? Then that way you can sand down to the, your binding and you don't pinch out the binding as you finish it. Now, I'm going to kind of jump ahead to the end of the process. <coughs> now, to put pearl into the binding, all right? When you go to set this up to do this part of it, Notice I have all of this here. In order to get that started, black, white, black. Getting your binding started can be a little bit tricky. 
<coughs> so when you go to start it, <coughs> we're recycling. You notice your, this poly strip will have tape on it. That tape is really only there for the slitting process of the poly. It's not there for any other reason. Just when they machine it, it doesn't stretch. But that little piece of tape, sometimes you may need to shim your pearl up. So you can use that little strip for a shim. If you overcut the channel, you can use cotton thread. That works in there, and that can hold your your pearl high so that you can get the pearl level with what you want to want to do. And when you're going to start your binding, this is the part where you. Uh, oh, by the way, does anybody know what luthier means in French? <coughs> Luthier, it's a French term, meaning man who learns to cuss. <laughs> oh, all right. Can't be as bad as working with cows. Huh? Can't be as bad as working with cows. Well, I think every trade has a, that's, it's token. So, I'm just using a typical celluloid binding. I take my binding, and your black, white, black will have a thick black, thin white, thin black. I generally put the thick black with a pearl. And my binding. And then in order to get this started, I'll work it in here. And once you get it set, it's easy to take off. All right? Now. We probably won't have time to bind a complete guitar, but you can see how that'll actually work. All right? So, we're going to jump ahead and show you what happens at the, fin the finished product. <laughs> you saw me pull the poly strip out, and that poly strip will hold and define the space for your pearl. Can you see that? All right? Okay, and it's also set up. I didn't go into a full 45. We don't have time to do that. So I put a black white along with it. Okay? Has anybody done pearl or seen pearl done before? Yeah. Okay. This is, I, I never get bored of this. Pearl is a fascinating material. And I don't buy the pre shaped, I use straight ablam, and I also use straight pearl. You can use almost any glue that you want to to use this. I like Typhon. What it, usually whatever glue is handy. Uh, I think, got to admit, I forgot my tight bond, so we're going to put this in with Duco. <laughs> my wife won't let me go to the dollar store to buy this anymore. I always go in and get six tubes and do we have the bags? <laughs> John, what, what type of glue did you use to glue the I use Duco, a uh, well on I know people use fish glue, tight bond. I, when I'm dealing with plastics, I like to use the, an ABS style or a, the, the Duco cement is cheap, easy to get. Uh, well done. Was it well done 40 Frank? I don't remember now. Yeah. And when you go to put the pearl in, this is curved. That is, and this is the part of the job that I just find fascinating. When you put pearl in, and we have to bend it, it will do its own thing. So you think the Duco is better than the, uh, the uh, liquid blue or just... Well, I act actually, I normally do uh, tight bond, uh -huh. and I hate to admit it, I forgot my tight bond, but Duco will work. Uh -huh. Okay, so how do you do this? And this is where you get sloppy. Anybody want to try this? <coughs> Huh? <laughs> you want to try it? Hold up. I'll show you how to get started. Now, you need a tool that is going to break the pearl. All right? Okay. It's not difficult. You can work a small area at a time. Duco sets up pretty quick. And you put it, just lay a nice bead in there. All right? Yeah, if you just run it, run the pearl against the, the stick the spruce, would you put it on top so it would bleed in without bleeding in? You got, you got, you got, most, you got most of the glue on the top. Yeah. 
Just say. Okay. I need something to break the pearl. Pocket knife works. Yep. Right here. Now, if you listen. Oh, did I? Yeah. That's the wrong pearl. He marked the pearl. Oh, I opened the wrong too. I'm sorry, I can't read. That was I grabbed the back pearl. You grabbed what, John? Back pearl. I grabbed the thin pearl. Okay. The pearl comes in a thin, thin strip. All right. There, throw that in there too. And all we got to do, and this is the hard part to learn. How hard do you push the pearl and how do you hold it? So when I start it, I get it in the groove. All right, see it working there? Yep, yep. Now listen. Hear it breaking? Yeah. And I, I'm gently holding it in. Not right. hard. I see what you're doing. Yeah. All right. Now I'm watching, see the pearl? Yeah, and I see the glue squeezing see it out, working its way along the side. All right, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. See the glue? That is sweet, dude. Then I take. Now I can read it, and it all, see how nice and flush that looks? Mm -hmm. All right, you want to try it? Sure. I see you left me the, the, the waste there. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm not stupid. <laughs> He's crafty. Yeah. And this is one place where, you, you know, you don't want to make a big mess, but, you know, wood glue, Tycon, Elmer's, Duco. I don't like to use super glue, especially on spruce. Some spruces, it will turn it yellow. Uh, on the back, like Brazilian, I'll use it. I won't use super glue on mahogany, maple, cherry. Uh, maple, mahogany, cherry. Any, any wood that will take the super glue and wick it in. Next thing you know, when you're trying to stain, you're going to find it have a problem. So, so you just walk it along and crack it. How hard that is? Really you never tough. did this before. I was always trying to use the bendy pieces. I know there's a product, uh, Zip Flex. I haven't used it. Yeah, there is. There's that product, and, and I was always trying to cut them and shape yeah. them and stick it. Wow, I didn't know that that's how it was done. Yeah, yeah. I was always like cutting it and sticking it in. No, I've never done it like that. No. I did it a really labor intensive way. If you want to come up and take a look at this? He actually. That's perfect. Yeah, that's great. Perfect. Okay. Was that hard? No. No, no, the way I was doing it was hard. That's mm -hmm. easy. The more you can break it, the more you can break those lines up, the less it will be seen. And then guys who want to finish like you back there, you want to try to keep the, the gaps as tight as possible. I mean, you're dealing with the natural products, so there's going to be some porous areas. The more, the, more you, the, the, the more you break it with the knife, yep. as you're going along, the tighter the gaps. So every quarter inch or so? Or just it, it'll, just, tell it's, you, it'll, it'll tell you. Yeah, it tells it you. Breaks yeah, the natural it breaks natural and natural Okay. It's a smaller angle. Huh? You're, spreading, and you're dividing any angle up right. over many, many small places exactly. instead of a big angle. Right. I mean, if you go buy a set of pearl that's cut machine prints, you'll see every line because it's in a straight line. <sighs> Anybody else want to try it? Mm. That's the way I do it. Yeah. So you can see it's not difficult. All right? A lot less time. Okay? A lot less time. A lot less time. Yep. All right, that, was, that alone was worth the price of the mission. The hardest part is learning to do this. And, and we're going to do that. I want to keep my eye on the clock. We've got like a whole hour. So, John, is that on your YouTube channel? Uh huh. It is. No, the pearl is just probably where I learned how to do it. Yeah, you don't want the pearl on that blade. What's that? Oh, well, a little bit. The top's here. So I also want to mention that when I do my tops, you want to do your tops. If you want to end up like a hundred and five, take a cement about a hundred and ten. Give yourself a five thousand smudge factor, and that way you're going to sand down to the pearl. Now, also, when you put this on, you can feel that this is just about level with the top. And I'm going to go around there and sand that. And Q, you've filled your share of pearl. I certainly have. And um, <coughs> would you agree that it's handy to have a bottle of thickened lacquer when you're doing this to drop fill your little voids rather than using super glue? Yeah, well, the lacquer and the super glue don't get along anyway. Yeah. So, it would be so you're just keeping pressure, pressure. As, you, as you're putting it, you're keeping yeah. pressure toward the 
Now, so you, the handiest little tool that you can make, uh, Stu Matt will sell them for $83.95. It's a nail that's sharpened like a needle. And <laughs> it works really good. Uh, an eight penny nail is perfect because it fits your hand, but make it a nice needle point. Because when you're doing this, at some point you're going to have to maneuver pearl. You might have a piece that will come up and pop up, you might lose a piece, you might have a gap. And then that way you can take that little, that little point and you can squish your pearl and block it in. And get it to get it. I use an awl. Yeah, and all the little fun. flat screwdriver. Yeah. I mean, it's not rocket science. This is simple. You're talking about to drive it. To push it to down. Push it 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 down. Push Okay, so let's see what I'm putting this in. And I have my handy dandy uh, oh, cool. I can take my fingernail and just work that down in. And, yeah. Each show is perfectly minor. Exactly. This is just the end. Yeah. No. So this is probably <coughs> that's uh, the polystyrene. Right there. This is the. Can I go up at the counter? Get the baggies. I buy it online. Uh, Amazon will have it. Yeah, it's it's not terribly expensive. I had trouble finding it. Uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of places, especially where they have a lot of meth labs, they, they don't sell it anymore. <laughs> Somebody asked the question. <laughs> no, uh, I've been using, I haven't had any problem with, with staining using conventional CA is the only one I ever had problems. John, what do you think is causing that yellow on CA is for thing? Uh, using an accelerator on it? I think there's two things. Accelerator for one, and number two, UV over time. I think that the CA is going to age differently than what the lacquer will do. Yeah. Any way to get rid of it? They go yeah, we top it. Yeah, it goes all the way through. Yeah, there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> It'll look anywhere from pea green to pea yellow. Yeah, I've had a red with pea wig and a horrible green. Mm. <laughs> red wing and cedar, yeah, it just sponges right in. Yeah, it, it just goes all the full depth. Yeah, it, it's it's a it's actually a shame. And I've never liked using C8 for binding because boy does it ever make a mess getting the cake off. Now when I'm doing wood binding. Uh, wood binding, and I'm doing pearl, that can be a little bit trickier because the wood, you're probably going to be using tight bond to begin with. And sometimes, unlike the plastics, you will have a, a little gap into the outside. So you want to be aware of that. And when that does happen, uh, know that you're going to have to attend some gap filling. Most gaps that I see will happen more on the back and the waist because we have this radius and you have this gyration happening on the binding. So if you clear, you're inside. And then when we get into taping, you have to think about down and in. Uh, I actually, if I'm using wood binding, will put clamps across here because the waist is the problem area. If you do get some gaps, <coughs> Generally, you're going to find most of the time the gapping is going to be on the side. That's where you can hide the side gapping a lot easier. Uh, what I do when I'm doing wood binding is I'll actually put the wood binding channel in. Then I go back, I have my little inlay tool, and I will cut the channel underneath there because I can take the gap right out. And that, that works real well for really hiding any gaps. If I do have to do gap filling, I don't like glue and dust. Glue and dust can leave a, a footprint, especially when you get into the finishing area. And I think you could agree with that. You know, so my favorite fill is going to take a sealer, whatever my sealer happens to be, vinyl sealer or even lacquer, if that's what I'm using, and I will sand, let the dust in, and I'll work lacquer in, and then I will make a paste with the lacquer and then work that in on top of that. 
see, this is how long have I been playing with this? Not long. Don't, don't let the ge oh. general public do it. Oh, this is fun. Remember, I've been doing this for 15 years. Okay. So we now, in that short bit of time, if you want to come up and look at this, uh, we have a top. Now what I will do when I do use Duco, when I'm all done, so that I'm sure I got a good coverage of glue, and I want to make sure I have this stuck in, I now just run a whole bead of Duco all the way around. And since we're guys, we like to pick and scratch. This will give you something while you're watching TV to pick out from underneath your fingernails. But if you come up and take a look, you can get an idea what this will look like under finish. So you started by laying Duco in the channel and then you started popping in the shell, is that what you did? Yep. Now, like I said, normally I use tight bond. I just happen to forget tight bond, but this will be a, a Duco for it. And now, let's say I just rub that in. Tight bond two or three? Never use tight bond two or three. Tight bond original, red. Right. Would you like to see this, Mr. Plain Ford? Do they can? Huh? Yes. We have a, some, it's it's some. We, Allow me to carry this to you. Nothing fancy. Yeah. Okay, don't worry. I can remember in 2003, uh, I, I met you <laughs> for the first time. Oh, my God. And you were... I can't remember 2003. <laughs> you had a, a Panama hat on. Thank you. Now I'm going to do the back. And now you get this. this the back curl is a little bit more problematic in that it is the same product, but it is thinner. So let me put away the 16. What are you doing with the grain fold on? What's that? What are you doing with the grain fold on? Sand it out. That's minor. I purposely want to do that so you can see that's going to happen. Another trick, and I'll show you that in a minute when we get into binding is it's perfectly okay to seal your wood before you do this, if you want to. Uh, that helps a lot in the, the tear out. Shellac, I actually like to use shellac because you can brush it on, you can spray it on. It dries reasonably quickly and it gives you a barrier coat that your tape will stick to and when you pull it up you won't do this. I like to use it so that I don't get bleed over between light and dark. All right. Uh, mahogany. I, I want to also give a plug for our friends at CF Martin. They donated this guitar, two of them, for me to do this. And the hardest part is getting this to start up. Once you get it out, and you notice I'm trying to keep from bleeding this time. Anybody was in my compression class? <laughs> I look like a stuck pig, didn't I? You did. That's a masking tape, didn't we? Or uh, you were... Somebody had a Band-Aid oh, finder. Yeah. They felt sorry for me. I actually have a doctor here, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't need tetanus shots. In fact, when I got back, I, Dave Nichols knew all about it before I even got back to the hall. So now you can see, and I'm going to reuse this on this guitar. So when you buy this stuff, you can reuse it, all right? We're doing good. Does that stuff fall again? The, the stuff, the white stuff you just pulled out? It's not, did you see the piece that went around? No, I didn't get back. Oh, come on up, I'll show it to you real quick. This, the, the poly Pass strips. Pass that back, John. I don't have a lot of discs. It's hard to get it back. Okay, yeah. yeah. Pass that back to him. Uh, I know Custom Pearl sells it. Uh, does Stu Mac have the poly, do you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think everybody's got okay. it. Dave sells it too, yeah. Pearl huh? Dave it also. Yeah, I, I get most of my Pearl from CF Martin, I mean the poly from CF Martin or Dave, uh, Dave at uh, Custom Pearl. I started backwards, but I can still remember. I mean, they just about make themselves very, very uncomfortable with certain suppliers, but I buy some sheets of the poly at 60,000 thick from deep plastics and then slice it in whatever width I yeah. need myself and save a bunch of money. Well, you can do whatever you want. It's not terribly expensive. Oh, yeah. 
but you can see this goes in without too much effort. Now, if we were doing side purl, I really wouldn't have time to show you how to do the side purl, because with the side purl, you have a secondary problem with, here we're going into this. Now, on the side, you're going this way, and it kind of pops up and down. So you got to be a little bit more precise in how you fit it. And it can be, it can be a pain. Uh, but as I mentioned in the shimming, uh, white cotton thread, any cotton thread for that matter, And you see, I'm just working an area as much as my glue will handle before it starts to set. That thought was about the cotton thread? I am sorry, what was, what was the thought about the cotton thread? Okay, if, when you do your routing, uh, remember, you can't make enough setup cuts. So you want to make sure that all of your setup cuts are done on a piece of scrap. And you want to have a little binding piece all rigged up so that you can take a look at it. And that it fits, because you want to... Try to get this as close as you can if you're using a binding machine, even if a hand router. You're better off taking five small cuts and one AFM cut. Does anybody know what an AFM is? Oh, moment. Oh. Oh. <laughs> and you want to make it that it is just, if you have a couple of thousands clearance on each side, the glue will fill that point. If you make it too sloppy, it will, it will show. And I mean, after all, for those of you that are doing this and selling a guitar, when you start getting into the higher end instruments, now you have people that like to take them home, get out their jeweler's loops, and look for every little flaw and drive you nuts. So, the handy bottle of thickened lacquer comes in big and handy for when you're doing any kind of drop fill. Is that what the Duco is? Uh, the Duco is a NASA tone based product, but it's not lacquer. Lacquer, nitrocellulose, we're talking nitrocellulose lacquer. Yeah. Okay. This has just been, for those of us that were born in the 50s and 60s, understand the secondary use of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any. Cars. Anybody here was an altar boy in a Catholic school? <laughs> me, and, me and my best friend, our job was to fill the cruets before, you know, for church. So we went over at lunchtime and we had to go downstairs and get the bottle of wine. Well, the cruet holds what? Three ounces. Two good mouthfuls. <laughs> so we grabbed two bottles of wine, we filled the cruet, we took two bottles of wine out back behind the schoolyard into the pines, and for lunch we each drank a bottle of wine. When we got back into the classroom about 20 minutes later, the world started spinning, and uh, we both got very ill, and the nuns thought we were sick, and oh my god, did they treat us good, my parents came, took me home, you poor boy. It wasn't until I was about 40 years old that I told my mom and dad what he actually did. <laughs> but you can see how easy this process is. Now there's a lot of uh, new materials out and they work similarly. Some of them unfortunately don't. So you want to be aware of what you're getting, what you're using. But you can just see how if the prep work is done, and I. I can't stress prep work enough, whether it is finishing, fretting, at the end. If you haven't taken the time to do the proper uh, base work, and you haven't prepped it properly, you are plaguing yourself, and the end result is only as good as you can. All right? Are we, yeah, the tape's still turning. Another handy tool for this is a toenail clipper. All right? Oh, it's like the old 8-track days. <laughs> Cassette. Flip. You can buy those on the Right. <laughs> God, I'm I'm asking. Toenail clippers, what they say? I use a straight toenail clipper. And that comes in really handy because it, you can break it very controlled. And I forgot to bring it. I have it over behind my table, so I'm going to have to kind of 
get lucky on this last break. And for those of you, if you want to come here, let me show you how to make an invisible joint when you go to get to the end. Okay, I'm going to try to get to this greatest point. I'm going to like kick the trap up real good. This is a good chance. Now, you think let's go right to the end. I'm going to go right to here. I think I need to write about that. That's pretty close. Now, I can break this. Give myself a little walk down. Yeah. Put that in here. Hey. Spreading the gaps a Yep. And now if it's a little too long, it's pretty close. I think might get lucky later as well. Talk it through, you're saving the last couple inches as a full straight section. Yeah, and you want to try to get as straight as you can. Now you can see that's just a hair high, but there's actually a break of way in there and wall up. Okay. Okay. And then we're gonna do the the schmear and strip, and I could do a perfect miter to match down here and match up here. How are you cutting that, that channel? The, the that channel? Yeah, how are you cutting that? What I do is I take, you know, that little inlay tool I have? Right, yeah. Okay, I have an inlay base that I modified that is dead flush. And I just right down. You can use an X-Acto knife. Fresh X-Acto knife, mm -hmm. follow your stop, go around, and then just it chisel, it out. chisel it out. But having this wide black here, now you don't have to worry about pushing it. You can go to the sander and follow your joint, make your joint perfect. And you aren't fighting umpteen pieces. You got one piece and you're done. The hardest part is matching that that miter out here. Right. Yeah. So you take a beer with you and you can celebrate <laughs> or cry in it. <laughs> so figure if you need 10 inches, take 15. That way you always work nice and take your time. Does that make sense to these guys? Not a bit. Not a bit. Sorry. Come on up here. Yeah, get, get, get up here. Okay, so you're, you're just creating a border around the tongue of the, of the exactly. fingerboard, right? Exactly. And what I'm doing is I'm taking oh, all oh, of this okay, material. I got you. Okay. I got you. Okay. So I take this material and I take a piece of pearl, like this long piece of pearl, yeah. and I cut into a board, lay a piece of wax paper. I put my black and white against here. All right. And I put my pearl in here. So I have my black, white, black, and I have my pearl. And for sake of discussion, this wonderful piece of tortoise has turned black, right? Sure. So we put that together, and you super glue that together. Okay. Now you got one piece. Yes. And then you can miter it in. Okay. So instead of trying to miter all this together, you got one piece. Okay. Okay. And this way, if you do overcut your channel, you squish it in there, take a straight pin, and hold it against there, and you're done. Um, we got a picture of the same thing across the bottom of the fender board. Okay. So the idea is to, is to match all this uh, super glue together so you have one uh, stick. Yeah, one right. stick so you're making one uh, stick. You you're put the dugo in the slot. Yep. What I didn't hear or get or understand even slightest what you're doing okay. to actually create the boundary, the stop, okay. or to inlay that. Well, I got some of the overlap right. of the tongue to this whole makeup. Okay. Well, let's pretend, for sake of discussion, this is your bar, your black, white, and pearl. Uh -huh. So now you mic this all together, right. and you get a reading. Right. It's X, right? So now you make a filler strip, X, Y. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, for sake of discussion, point 0.18. Mm -hmm. So you make a piece of wood, point 0.18, and that goes right against your fingerboard. Now your fingerboard has a tape. Then you take a piece of aluminum that has a straight edge and you put that against this against the fingerboard. So you know where the, del the delineation of the black, white, black, pearl, black, white view are. Yeah, I need to see a picture. It's all right. I'm not getting it. And I'm 3D. I'm 3D, but I can 
see these things. Well, if this, is, them, but if this is the You're edge. still routing out a slot at the top, yeah. right? Right, but and you're, you're leaving a patch for the tongue right. to still meet on that. So, so here's you your finger you need a channel. This is this is the edge of your fingerboard. Uh -huh. This is your pearl, yeah. your black, white, black, and pearl, mm -hmm. right? That goes here. Uh -huh. That's going to be X thick, mm -hmm. right? So you have a filler strip. This mm -hmm. that goes here. That, that's a piece of wood. Mm -hmm. Now you take an aluminum straight edge. This that goes against there. Okay. Now you can take that away. Right there's the outline limit of what you need to cut. Now there's a click. Yeah. We're talking about making a template so that you can so that when you, get your, you need to get your black white black, black right. pearl and black white so that so it lines up to the edge exactly the same of the fret line. It's a layout technique. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. so if you if your board was ready bound. Well whether you the board has to be done. The neck the has board to is done. The neck has to be finished. Right. So this is the line of right there's your neck. That's right, the finger that's the is finished but not glued. And this is your filler strip of the black, white, black pearl. Okay? That's the, the finger board job. This is your finger board. Not right? But the fingerboard's not there yet because the neck's not right. Really but yet, but pretending this is the fingerboard. Mm -hmm. This is the filler strip that represents your black, white, black, your own black, white. And that goes in here. So you you didn't do that all together. You're only just doing one side of it. So I'm going to do all of it. Now, in a 45, you're going to have a pearl ring here. Right. But now you, you've delineated the exact point where the pearl and the black, white, black outside point would be here. Right. So now you put a straight edge right there. Right. So that when you and me and you're going to put one at this edge and you're going to put one at this edge, you're going to totally surround the fingerboard extension. Mm -hmm. So now when you take the neck out, you have those, you have the outside lines lined out. And then you can scribe it with an X-Acto knife. Whatever you can cut that out, and then your channel is coming in underneath the fretboard. Oh, 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 okay. Now you got it. Okay. So now we're going to throw this pearl. I'm going to throw the binding onto the box. Now you saw how easy it was to do the actual pearl work. Now you're going to get to see how easy it is to do the binding. Now I have. Move around the back of the table, please. Okay. You won't be No. Well, if, if I was on a 45, yes, I'd be mitering that in. In this case, we don't have the time to do that. But yeah, whenever you're doing mitering, whenever you can take a combination of pearl, black, white, black, and make the bar, you have one piece to handle, not three or four. I mean, in the old days, you had black, white, black, pearl, black, white, black, binding, black, white, black, pearl, black, white. We're talking 14 pieces. Now they use black, white, black. You know, so the more you can combine, the better off you're going to be. All right, so now, black, white, black, binding, pearl. To get this started, again, be careful how much pearl uh, this you use. You want the glue there, all right? Binding. And my black white strip with the white going to the wood, my binding. You don't know. All right? Looks like you need about four hands, five hands. Ah, six. God gave us two hands. We found ways to use five or six of them. You want to put your, your black white black together so that you have it where you want it. I'm trying to put the thick in the middle. And then I take my poly, and I slide this in here. And now I can do any tweaking I need to to get it started. So now I have it started. Can we, can we try not using any cuss work while we're doing this right? I'm thinking that. It's OK to think, it just don't say. But now, Watch how easy this is. Now I'm working in what I call my push pull mode. My bottom piece moved on me, but now with that tape here, see how I can work that right in there? And now all I'm going to think is down and in. 
and I put the pearl, I mean, sorry, put the tape on the side, and I'm actually squishing, and you can watch. In a way, we kind of have a hydraulic cylinder here, so we're getting the glue to come out. So we're doing the individual layers? Yep. And if you watch this, now it just goes real easy. I'm going to go down almost to the waist, because I can pull. Because if I can pull in tension, I can get this to fit my groove properly. And coming around the curves is the hard part. And for wood bindings, would you use Duco glue also, or just or some just I use, white glue? I use tight bond, white glue, whatever. What about fish oil? Uh, fish oil, I don't think it would work, but fish glue might. I mean, fish oil. <laughs> <laughs> John, John, would your technique be any different with the wood binding, other than the glue? Uh, other than the glue, it would be, the only difference is here, if, okay, for sake of discussion, if we were doing a wood binding, because the wood binding would have to be bent, and what you want to do when you're setting up your wood binding, instead of having one piece going around, we have to deal with the joint. So here I like to use a scarf joint. I will actually set it up so the outside of the scarf joint hits my center. And what I'll do when you get down here into the waist with wood binding, that that's if you're... Piece, is that just doubling around? Huh? That rolling piece, that's just doubling around. Okay. Yes. It will, so here's where you gotta uncuss. And if I push down on it, and now I can push into it, I can get that set in. So you see that technique. Here I can pull, here I'm pushing. I'm pushing it gets it into the waist. Sorry, you're saying it's a hydraulic action and it's yeah. something that blew up in between all of them. Exactly. But they're not twisting. Nope. Take a look. Is there a real trick to getting the uh, purplane from getting swirly? Obviously, you've got potentially three or four different heights of purpling, pearl, binding, all that. People on the channels at the same time. Well, actually, the, the big deal there is, as I said, when we get into setting up the route cuts, you really want to be aware that all of those different shelf levels are set. And to keep it from getting swirly, the glue will actually help you because it's working as a lubricant while it's wet and lets everything slide into position. From here to here, I can pull because I can pull it right into the channel. When I get to the waist, I got to push because that forces it into the channel. Now I can literally run my glue all the way over to here. Ultimately, you're still keeping all the strips proud at the top of the surface of the guitar. I don't. If they aren't proud, I want them reasonably close because my tops are always going to be. They are not the final size. I'm going to hand sand them to the final depth. I always leave about probably five thousandths or so. <laughs> okay. All right? And depending upon how well you do your setup, that is the key to the whole thing. Getting your setup stuff. Yes, sir? I thought you said in the beginning that you wanted to inset them and then you'd scrape the sides down. But well, he's talking at the top. Yeah. He's not talking the side. He's talking the, the top plane to the top of the button. Okay. Anybody else have a question? And the reason for that is so that you can sand in the curve at the top. You got it. And you can sand, I want to sand, and flush. I want to sand the sides down to the binding, not scrape the binding to the sides. I don't care on the top if I'm a little proud or level. But the side is the, side is the critical point because the side of the, of the binding when you get into your scraping, that is where you're going to run into trouble. Now you see how wide I did that whole section? And I'm pulling on that. All right? And that's setting this in. Now if you also take notice, my bottom black has rolled over here. So I can slide this out. And now I can work that right back in and take a piece of tape just to hold it. And now I can just work that right back in nice and neat. You said that rolled on you, that's why you pulled it out? Yeah, it rolled, rolled uh, sideways. Okay. Yeah. But there you go. I'm John, that in. sure is a lot easier than wood bindings. Yeah. A lot easier with the plastic. Plastic bindings are very good. They're more protective, actually, than wood bindings are. And now I'm pushing that in, and now we have to think about down, all right, and in. So one binding side onto the top. One on the top, down to the side. You rotate them. Yeah. 
and I'm watching, and that little spin. I'm not seeing the light on that side. Yeah, you used to be old again. Remember luthier. No? Remember what luthier means. Now, the one nice thing about uh, Duco cement, I can reactivate it by adding more glue. And having my tape ready, and up by pulling. What is the working time of the glue? About five minutes. But the nice thing is, when I put more glue on there, it hasn't cured yet. Duco takes a probably about 24 hours to truly cure cure. So by adding more glue, we're good. And what's the advantage of Duco over white glue? What's that? What's the advantage over, over white glue? Oh, when you're dealing with plastics, it will, be, it will help to get the plastic to weld into the wood. Okay, so that, that's a specific note. Duco is, is really neat for plastic binding. Yeah. Uh, I've tried, I know somebody once said, if you take plastic binding and you rub it with sandpaper, you can use tight bond on it. And the sad part is, two years later, all the binding came off. So I don't use tight bond with any plastic. Makes perfect sense. It's designed for wood. That's it. So now, I'm almost done with the top. And the only exception to that is if you are putting binding on that has the guitar that has finish on it. Yeah. Doing a repair work, you have to use white glue. You cannot use Duco. No, you got to be very careful with Duco. Duco and lacquer, they are not friendly because the acetone base of the Duco cement will cause lacquer finish. And then, as a repair person, that's another couple days of work. And you can see I'm really careful how I put my glue on. <laughs> Did I just hear you right? It's not a good idea to shellac the channels. I don't think it is. What if you're doing the pearl inlay on the top? The pearl? Yeah. I only use the shellac on the top itself. I don't use the shellac in the channel. Okay? Okay. So you put the shellac on and then do your routing. Yep. I don't want to use shellac and glue together as far as I don't want the surface that I am going to glue to having shellac on it. You want it to be wood. I want yeah. I want to glue to wood. I don't want to glue to shellac. Right. Okay? Now here I had this little puppy roll over so you see me pick this out. I can squish that in and I got it right back in. So in a way we're dealing with Chaku Stone and the meaning of the octopus. <laughs> and you can get that right back in. Alright? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm just wasting a Beating my head against the wall. Huh? You'd be beating your head against the wall? I've done enough of them. I actually enjoy the binding process. And Huh? <laughs> Too much duco. I just, you know. <laughs> and there we go. What's that? <laughs> uh, I found that Amazon.com has it. And, uh, no, it's available. What was the question? The Where tape? I got my Duco. Oh, your Duco. What about the green tape? Why, why do you use that versus the old brown binding tape? It stretches. Oh, that's true. The brown stuff doesn't stretch. Brown right. works good, but, but if, you, if you're green, watch, you're green. You know, if I tighten that up like I'm supposed to, I wouldn't be flopping. Right <laughs> you should talk to the guy who makes those. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I would warn you, those water directions. spills you took this morning were. Is this an <laughs> info commercial for the cradle? Yes. <laughs> this increases the possibility of the honesty of too much duco. <laughs> and I love it to get underneath my fingernails, but there you go. And then you can go over this and you can push everything down. Now I am an inch short on my Teflon up here. And when you go to put the pearl in, that will squirt out pretty well. 
will be fine. John, does that happen to be the Scotch 233 plus green tape? They call the 233 tape has been discontinued. It is now 401. Don't. Don't. It, but it's the same tape, trust me. And you're not going to worry about putting a little Teflon in that gap there, John? Uh, if I was at home in my shop, yeah, I you, would. You would do, okay. Yeah. Right. But actually, what would happen later, when you could do the pearl, you can loosen that up and squish it over. I got you. Because that's, most of that's under the fingerboard anyway. Right. Okay, is there any questions on what I did? So there's enough glue now between what you put on the on the top and what you had in the groove. They don't have to put anything in between the different layers. Yeah, we're good. He's happy. Yeah. John, you would use more uh, masking tape if you had more time, right? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, even what I have there, because of the push pull, I mean, I pulled this Where's over the there. Where's the gears pull? And you can see on the top and everything. Hey, where is it from, Dave? Oh, yeah. So now you know what I'm going to do tonight. Acetone will clean this off, but you shouldn't put acetone on your fingers. That's the reason for that. And then don't, you know, don't try to start a fire while it's <laughs> All right, is there anything that you have a question on? I mean, I couldn't have been that good of a teacher. John, did you talk about, um, you went through the whole thing about the detail around the tongue of the neck. Uh -huh. Did you talk about making a transition vertically from the binding to that horizontal? Outline, like up the neck uh, and, and the the tailpiece. So you're coming, you're coming around. I guess it's all on the surface anyway. So your black and white that's on the inside. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just going to be a minor joint to continue around. Yes. The of the neck. Yeah. Now, generally, what I will do when I'm doing my miter joint, and I have my little bar. All right. When you're doing the miter joint, since the miter joint is actually off of the pearl. So where's the trouble? Here is my bar. That's going to be my black, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to be my black, white, black, right? Here's my pearl. Here's my black, white, all right? Now this would be fitting. I actually drew it up kind of backwards. So let me do that this way here. Should be this way. Here's your black, white black, here's your pearl, and here's your black white, all right? This outside miter is coming in, so the miter has to be like this, and then you sand that off. Coming across here, you have your black, black white, your pearl, black white black. So this miter has to come into here. All right, so now you can see when you sand this off, you can sand that even though you've taken that black out, you're just mitering these big sticks together. But this one is the tricky one. You got to get that miter to catch into this. Mm -hmm. And a little emery board, a piece of wood with like, I have like 120 grit, 220, and like 350. When I get real close, I go to the 350. And I will actually, if this is your surface pearl, I'll actually like undercut it a little bit so that I can butt that top nice and tight. So I have an AHT joint. And what, that's just like a quick, a quick swipe over a 320 grit or something? Yeah, just a little bit. I don't want to make it like a 45 degree. The angle is going to be so slight, but that point of contact at your visual is going to be AHT. Uh, yeah. Okay, does but anybody... Also, that's another trick you can use in creating that zero joint, right? Right, yep. All right. Another trick that I, I know people sometimes will do, will actually have this miter, but they take the pearl, this pearl comes across, they put like a point and drop the pearl into that point. I like the, I like the miter. All right? Yeah. Cool. All right. Any questions again? So what's the most exotic thing you've been like? Pearlzilla. Pearlzilla, that's the most exotic. That, that is not only inlaid on the outside, the inside's inlaid. The uh, side support braces have the tree of life on it. My wife's name is on the waist on one side. My son's waist is on the other. Three bluebirds are on the tailpiece, and the back cross grain has pearl all the way up through it. Pearlzilla, is that the one million? 
No, 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 that's my guitar. Uh, if you go to the unofficial Martin Guitar Forum, you'll see that as my little Emicon, and I think I have a picture of that on my Blues Creek guitar site. And that has... A, no pearl. Yeah. <laughs> it took me a year to do it. Yes, sir? Um, we do a lot of restoration work in our shop. Okay. Uh, and these are fantastic building techniques, but I've always struggled with the, with the, uh, you know, with the glue and the lacquer, and also yes. the fact that, you know, when it's manufactured or, or, or made or whatever, yep. this is all done prior to finishing. So right. everything, regardless of whether you scrape the wood down, scrape the binding or whatever, everything is, everything is flush and all to itself, and then the finish goes on top of that. Right. So when you're doing the restoration, you necessitate that you're going to have to do finishing work. And I've yeah. always shied away from using the type on, on this type of stuff, even with restoration, because you know, you're not guaranteed the holding power for the length of time. You want to get that stuff melted into the wood. Well, if I'm doing restoration pearl work, mm -hmm. uh, I will well, use... Pearl and such binding. You know? Yeah. If I'm doing restoration like, a, like on a 39 D28, right. okay. Hot high glue is the glue I use. Okay, but that's what I use for everything. And, now, and it will hold the, the plastic? It, it does reasonably well. Sometimes if you have just a little piece, I will cheat and take a needle into thin super glue and pick up a drop yeah. and put it at the crack. I mean, it depends on what particular issue you're dealing with. If you're replacing ivory binding, yeah, type on wood glue will hold that well. Of course. If you're taking a acetone, uh, celluloid plastics that they used in those times, you have to be careful, most of that shrank. And what I will do, if I have the next off, I usually pull the whole side binding and back it down and, instead of trying to, to heat it up and, and expand it. If I have to replace it, I will open up a little bit into a scarf joint, and there I will be very careful. I usually use, here I use scotch tape, and I'll tape over the joint razor blade cut open where the binding's going to be. Yeah, you're going to have a little bit of finish damage, but most of the crap's going to go on the tape and a little bit of destroy. But you're right, if you've got a smear duco cement or anything like that on, on that old lacquer, no, no, no. the less work, the more masking off you can do, the better off you are. And there I like to use scotch tape for that. What are you doing? I use a uh, 3M fine line tape because uh -huh. uh, it doesn't shrink and I've got all different widths and uh, I'll get that in pretty close and then as I get farther out I'll use a, uh, a very low tack painter's tape. Okay, that's like I just spend way more time taping off the instrument yeah. Yeah. and then I go after it with the heavy artillery, whatever adhesive I want to use, probably a CA. Yeah, get it masked um, off. I mean, I, I don't want to see the guitar come back. No, no right. one time, one time in shock. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if you have shrunk bindings, we often have, where it opens at the waist and the neck off, and you pulled the binding. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll do a little test. Sometimes it'll come off clean right around the uh, upper bow. But if it starts kind of getting a little crackly, then uh, just heat it, heat it with a, a putty or gun. What, what I, I've been doing is take a little bit of lacquer thinner in a real fine, almost like a, uh, a pinstriping, you know, br bristle about this long. I dip that into lacquer thinner, just go right at the joint. That softens it enough so I don't I don't have a breakup. Yeah, I'm going to have to do some finish work, yeah. but I'm going to have to do finish work anyway. Sure. And this way, sometimes I can save the lacquer on the binding. Yeah. And now I could just have, I would rather drop fill than overspray. Yeah. Sorry, what was that technique you just described? Using lacquer thinner to release the binding? No, no. On an old guitar, if you're doing a repair. Okay, if you're doing a repair on a five-year-old guitar, or you're doing a repair on a 39 Mark, I mean, they're two different animals. And the old celluloid plastic would shrink, and it would usually come off in the waist. All right, and when you're dealing with old guitars, old lacquer, the more you can protect the old finish, in the long run, the better off you are. I mean, Pat's done more of them than I have, but we all learned our little tricks from talking to people, you know, you don't want to create a bigger problem than you're trying to repair. Sure. So you know, whenever you're dealing with an old guitar and you're dealing with binding issues, you are going to have some finish work. But you're much better to drop off or just do a line of lacquer than overspraying the guitar. Yeah. 
you know, you want to do control the damage, control the repair. And the lacquer thinner with the bristle brush was used how and why? Well, you use that to soften the lacquer. lacquer. That softens lacquer so when you take it off, you aren't shattering it and scattering it across the room and leaving it cracked. It'll come off and it will, will come in a fairly nice, it's almost like gum. Yeah. And, you know, in a couple of days, in about two weeks, it'll cure back up. That's, that's about it. I mean, the more you play with it, the more you understand the chemistry of the finishes. I wish we had more time to get into more technical stuff, but I mean, that's enough to fry your brain for a little bit. To let you know, on YouTube, this will be on YouTube, so I, I need to get you to sign a release for oh, your story. Okay. <laughs> Consider it wise.